Well, joining us now is the Brookings Institution's Dr. Rashawn Ray. He's a David Rubenstein Fellow in Governance Studies and has been writing about reparations in the U.S. Thanks so much for being here. Really appreciate you taking the time. Let's start with Juneteenth. How does Juneteenth becoming a federal holiday push reparations into the spotlight? Well, thank you for having me on. I think it definitely pushes it in the spotlight. I mean, look, make no mistake, Juneteenth becoming only the 11th federal holiday is a big deal. All Americans should embrace it and celebrate it. It marks the end of a stain, a huge stain on the United States. But what it's also doing is creating a culture of reparations, a culture of change in how we hmm. think about it. The attitudinal shift that you just heard about is important because a majority of Americans do not know much about Juneteenth. They also do not know much about how Reconstruction failed. And because of that, they don't have a good sense of why reparations is the next step in the progression to healing the United States of America. Right. That's that's my one question. I mean, if you kind of had to produce a plan here, right, on how reparations can can move forward from here, what are the steps that we should be taking? So I think it's a few things. The first thing people have to realize is that since 1989, there has been legislation being presented in Congress called H.R. 40. It's the legacy of 40 acres in a mule, the form of reparations that were promised to Black Americans following the Civil War that never happened. So that legislation needs to be passed to form a reparations commission. We also need to pass the Truth and Reconciliation legislation being led by Representative Barbara Lee. H.R. 40 is now being led by Representative Sheila Jackson Lee. And then when it comes to the implementation of that, uh, my colleague at Brookings, Andre Perry, and I, we've laid this out. Not only does it need to be about direct cash payments, but it needs to be a 21st century reparations new deal for Black Americans to deal with education, to deal with housing and business ownership. What does that look like? Because we've seen some experiments uh, already uh, happen when it comes to reparations here in the United States, uh, one particularly uh, in the Midwest, uh, and that has to do with, with real estate. So, Because when people hear reparations, I think a lot of them immediately think cash payments. But what does 21st, 21st century reparations look like? So I think in addition to cash payments, it means looking at tuition grants mm. for descendants of people who were enslaved. It also includes student loan repayment. We know that Black Americans are much more likely to take on student loans because they don't have that intergenerational transmission of wealth, most of which is wrapped up in home ownership. There also need to be grants for home ownership, grants for housing revitalization to rebuild up Black communities, and then grants for Black businesses that we know were disproportionately impacted during COVID-19, where over 90% initially did not receive PPP funding and over 40% closed as a result. And people always ask, how do we pay for it? Well, look, I've written about this in Business Insider. My colleague, my colleague Andre Perry, we've talked about this extensively. Federal land is the answer. 25% of land in the United States is federally owned. As people know who own land, that land can be sold or it can be leased. And that is how you start to pay for reparations. It's interesting because you already pointed to a few bills that are that are making its way through Congress and, and you said need to be passed. My question to you is how much of the responsibility falls on the federal government and state and local governments? How do we think about who we really need to focus our efforts on in the near term? And are there other constituents that we really need to be considering when it comes to uh, how to move this forward? Great question. Well, look, everyone is implicit in this. One thing that Senator Cory Booker always says is that change doesn't come from Washington. Change comes to Washington. So while the federal government definitely has a role to play because the federal government allowed for state-sanctioned state violence and enslavement of Black people, but so did states. Universities also sold slaves to create their endowment. And we've seen some universities already grappling with that. Georgetown, Princeton Theological Seminary. In, 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 in Virginia, the entire state decided to pass legislation to address reparations in their universities. And then, of course, we could talk about Evanston and states like California, Maryland, and others that are aiming to move forward here. So look, everyone has a role to play, including the corporate sector, many of which has benefited from this. Why is this? Because in 1860, before the Emancipation Procl Proclamation, before the Civil War ended, but during it, 
Black people, just our physical bodies were worth more than the railroads and the factories put together. We have not even got to the cotton, the tobacco, and other crops that were being produced. The other thing people have to recognize is that following the Civil War during failed reconstruction, slave owners not only got their land back, but some of them, like in Washington, D.C. and in that area, also got reparations for lost wages, those lost wages being formerly enslaved people. So there is a legacy here that we have to make sure we deal with. And again, the United States is not opposed to reparations. We've seen it for Japanese Americans, for American Indians, and even the United States has played a role in ensuring that Jews and Jewish Americans who were impacted by the Holocaust have gotten reparations, including their descendants. America only seems to be against reparations for black people, and that's something that needs to change. Yeah, it, it seems to be uh, that it is changing a little bit. We saw the statistics there on the screen just now. 29% of Americans, according to Gallup in the last couple of years, are, are, are now for reparations. Uh, I, I want to talk about the connection between Juneteenth and uh, Juneteenth being recognized as a federal holiday uh, and systemic racism in this country, because Juneteenth, big step in awareness and in recognition, when it comes to being recognized as a federal holiday, they, reparations would certainly be a big step forward in paying for the sin that was slavery. But but how do we eradicate systemic racism here in the United States? Well, look, I think it's a tall order, but the symbolism of a Juneteenth holiday is a big deal. I hmm. also think that President Biden and his administration are sending a strong message to state legislatures, to school districts and schools saying, look, cut it out in regards to trying not to allow for discussions of racism to happen in schools. This is the reason why we're in this boat and the reason why a lot of people don't know what's going on. So Juneteenth is important for a cultural and attitudinal shift. Of course, the legacy of Juneteenth is that was the date when uh, some of the last enslaved Black people in Galveston, Texas, were told that they were now free. It is something that we should all celebrate, that we should all embrace, and then work, focus on healing it. I want to Tell, tell people this. Imagine if following the Holocaust, and look, I spent time in Germany. I taught at the University of Mannheim. I studied the way that Germany aimed to repair itself. But imagine if we fast forward 156 years after the Holocaust, and the only mm. thing that has happened is a federal holiday. People mm. would be wow. livid. Well, but that is the yeah. status we're at as it relates to Black Americans. I have a question. You know, to date, less than a dozen senators have been... Um, have been African American, less than a dozen in the history of the U.S. Senate. How much does representation matter here, and how much has that been a hindrance, perhaps, to some of what you're saying in getting passed? Well, look, representation obviously matters. I wrote about this after President Biden's congressional address where Senator Tim Scott had a response. And when we look at the history of the United States of America, there are racist origins. And those origins continue to impact us to this day when it comes to systemic racism, which is simply the way that racism permeates our rules, laws, regulations, and procedures that govern us. And there is no more better example of this than in Congress, particularly in the Senate, where there have been less progress when it comes to racial representation, not just for black Americans, but for all people of color than in basically any other social institution in the United States. How do we expect for policy to change when we aren't mm -hmm. seeing the representation? Because right. representation is the first step toward inclusion and equity. Well, we hope to keep following this with you. This is the Brookings Institution, Dr. Rayshawn Ray. Thank you so much for your time today on a really historic day. That's going to do it for us at Quick Take Focus. Uh, Tim, you know, what a day. Yeah, it's a big day. Look, I think the conversation is just starting now. You've